Welcome to this edition of Backstage Pass with Leah Chang. Today, I'm at the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures in Los Angeles. On this edition of Backstage Pass with Leah Chang, you'll meet prolific Oscar-nominated filmmaker Arthur Dong, who has curated a terrific film series presented by the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, Hollywood Chinese, The First 100 Years. I flew to L.A. to celebrate the 15th anniversary since the release of Arthur Dong's Hollywood Chinese documentary and finally got my signed copy of Arthur Dong's book, Hollywood Chinese, the Chinese and American Feature Films. On November 4th, I attended the opening night reception of the film series, which featured a screening of Hollywood Chinese and a post-screening conversation with Arthur moderated by Academy Museum Director and President Jacqueline Stewart. On November 5th, the Academy Museum featured a double bill of the cult classic Big Trouble in Little China and Black Widow as a special tribute to James Hong, who plays Lopan in the film. Arthur presented a deep dive into Hong's 68-year career before the film and moderated a panel with Big Trouble in Little China cast members James Hong, Dennis Dunn, and Peter Kwong. I played a Wing Kong guard in the film, and it was wonderful to reunite with my castmates before I headed to LAX to catch a red eye back to New York. It's my delight to welcome all of you as we continue to have the opening weekend of this film series, Hollywood Chinese, The First 100 Years. This series shares the title not only with an amazing documentary that we screened last night uh, that is having its 15th year anniversary, as well as a book that came out just a few years ago by Angel City Press. All three of them, uh, the series, the book, and the documentary are the work of author, filmmaker, and founding member of the Academy Museum's Inclusion Advisory Committee, Arthur Dong. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, a real um, honor and pleasure and privilege to be here. Uh, we've been working on this series for el well over a year. Uh, even before the museum opened, Bernardo and I were having meetings about something, uh, a series like this. So it's just a thrill uh, to have you all here to be a part of it. Uh, the, uh, the genesis or a, a motivation of this series was very much based on uh, the mission of the museum, which is to really celebrate film history, filmmakers, uh, but at the same time critique the industry and critique the product that has them coming out of this town. Uh, and when I say town, I'm saying Hollywood. It, as a, in a generic way, and but tonight I'm I'm trying to think I was you know writing over here I was trying to think what can I critique about tonight? Uh, maybe I mean it's all about celebration. It's all about James Hong, and the only critique I could think of was there's not a mini series uh, based on Big Trouble in Little China on Netflix. <laughs> You know, so uh, so if there are any Netflix executives out there, that's my critique of the town. And here's a very early photo of him, uh, about 1938. He, he is on the far left, your far left, uh, and they're standing in front of their family store. Uh, those are his siblings, uh, and they lived upstairs in this store. And I was reading the the uh, the, the, the uh, signage on the window. And it says Chow Mein Supplies. So maybe we can ask him about the Chow Mein Supplies in Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis. Uh, uh, he came out to L.A. at about in the early 50s and with uh, Don Parker, his partner in a comedic a comedy routine. Uh, and they started making the rounds. One of his first gigs was on the Groucho Marx show, where he actually imitated in front of Groucho Marx. And if you know Groucho Marx, you don't do that. But he imitated Groucho Marx in front of Groucho Marx, and it was a big hit. And that really kicked off his career. One of his early f motion pictures, if not the earliest, now this is, he had a couple other uncredited roles, but this is one of his earliest films, uh, is Love is a Many Splendid Thing. I, I, I love this photo. Uh, because in it, it's one of his earlier films, but he's, but also on 
this side, <laughs> starting from this side, there are other three actors from the Chinese Asian American community. Beulah Kuo, uh, if you know Beulah Kuo, she's one of the mainstays of uh, the Chinese American acting community. It was one of her first roles, but next to her is Philip Ahn, Korean American by this time in the 50s, a veteran of Hollywood films, and also Key Luke, who famously played Charlie Chan's number one son starting in the mid 30s. So, I, you know, I love pictures like this because, and Jennifer Jones is there next to uh, James. Uh, I love pictures like this because it makes me conjure up what, what was happening here behind the scenes, what was uh, lunchtime like, you know, uh, what were they talking about? Watching Jennifer Jones, uh, she's white, and playing a half, a mixed blood uh, doctor, Chinese and white, uh, in yellow face. And, and what, what were they talking about? And I can only imagine, and, and I've asked James, I don't think he quite remembers what was going on then. Uh, but I'm sure he was thrilled to have a part. Another early role is China Gate, being directed by Sam Fuller. And throughout his whole career, uh, James had worked with some of the most incredible directors, Sam Fuller, uh, Jennifer Jason uh, Nelson, uh, and uh, Robert Wise. Uh, and he's had this incredible breadth of experience with directors. Uh, a film following China Gate is Flower Drum Song, which we'll be playing on November 25th here. Uh, and with Nancy Kwan in attendance. So, but there's a short scene in which uh, James uh, plays a head waiter of the nightclub, and here's a shot from that scene. Uh, and it's so typical, James, of just being incredulous, you know, just, it's just, you know, the scene in Chinatown, which I, actually I'm gonna show a shot of, when, uh, you know, he just slams the door on Jack Nicholson. It's that look, it's that look he, had, he has throughout the scene in Flower Drum Song. So he's honed that look since 1961. Another show that we're going to be playing is Sand Pebbles. And that's being played next Sunday, not tomorrow, but next Sunday, as part of our Oscar Sunday's focus, where we look at past Oscar winners uh, and through a Hollywood Chinese lens, particularly my Hollywood Chinese lens. And in this film, what's really wonderful about it is we, it features a an Oscar-nominated performance by Mako uh, as a Chinese coolie. And Mako had, from there on, had this wonderful, distinguished career on stage, in TV, and on film. And he was one of the co-founders of East West Players, uh, along with James. And here is James playing that uh, a role in, a, a small role in the Sam Pebbles. Uh, and, you know, I was mentioning we critique and, and celebrate certain titles in this series. Uh, we celebrate Mako. We celebrate the fact that Bila Kuo is also in this film, along with James Hong. They got paying gigs, and that's important. They got to work with Robert Wise right after he won the Oscar for The Sound of Music and West Side Story. So that's an incredible experience. But Bila and James were were hired to play less than desirable roles. Uh, and I hope you'll be able to come and watch this production just to witness the kind of work that actors had to uh, accept, uh, whether or not they wanted to play those roles or not. And of course, throughout the 30, well, how many years has James worked? Over 60 years, 68 years. He's played his fair share of um, wise masters. And I, in one uh, conversation I had with him, he said, yeah, if it weren't for these wide old masters, I'd be out of 30% of my income. Uh, you know, so uh, thank goodness for, I guess, wide old masters that, that kept James alive and paying the mortgage. One film that was very key to James' outlook on being a Chinese American actor, an Asian American actor in this industry, is Confessions of an Opium Eater. And the script was circulating, this is talk, it was in production in the early 60s. The script was circulating, uh, he read it, other Asian American actors read it, and it, just, it was just full of the most offensive stereotypes. Opium dens, slave girls, hatchet, wars, you know, Tong wars, uh, lecherous Chinese men ogling Chinese girls, uh, the slave trade. It was just really the epitome of the worst. Uh, and it really upset James, particularly because he saw his fellow actors auditioning. 
And there was actually a, a level of protest uh, with some community groups uh, that he was a part of to protest the script during the script writing phase. Now, before production went on, and they met with the filmmakers, these community groups, and they promised they would not uh, uh, make an offensive production, that they will, they had listened to the complaints and they would adjust the script accordingly. Well, this being the town it is, that didn't happen. And distinguished actors like Philip Ahn was uh, hired to play roles like this. I don't think, I, I think this is a picture that really speaks a lot. Uh, Vincent Price was in the lead role. Uh, the women were just uh, objects of desire. Uh, and it led to just really an angry uh, community uh, because they were uh, full. They were lied to, and uh, nothing changed. Uh, he, along with Bula Kuo uh, and Mako and others, I think four others, then formed a, uh, a theater group that focused on authentic and, and real or, and, and substantial roles for the Asian American actors in LA. And that group led to the formation of East West Players, which is by and large the most substantial and biggest and longest running Asian American theater group in America. Uh, and it's still operating today uh, in downtown Little Tokyo. Uh, but more protests came. There was a protest against Charlie Chan being revitalized. Uh, and James was a part of that movement. TV was a lucrative uh, source of jobs for James in the 70s, as well as with many Asian American actors in town, uh, which led to that wonderful role uh, where he slams the door in front of Jack Nicholson. And uh, roles like Blade Runner came along. Wayne's World, and of course tonight we're here celebrating Big Trouble in Little China. And who has one of these, right? I've got one, <laughs> and uh, an original one, not a remake. This is the the real thing. Uh, and also after tonight, uh, the first showing uh, is a double feature tonight. I hope you understand that, know that. Uh, it's the second film, Black Widow. And when I was talking to James about his career, you know he, what? He has over five hundred acting credits, right? Uh, and more if you count voiceovers and, and, and game shows and all of those games. Uh, he picked out, I said, well, are there some favorites? And he picked out Black Widow. Uh, and I've always, and I said, so I had to seek out Black. And, and so it's a marvelous performance. Uh, he doesn't come, you know, I hope you stay for the second feature. He doesn't come on until like maybe 50 minutes in. Uh, but then the first 50 minutes are really a really fun, well, it's not fun, it's a murder mystery, uh, with Deborah Winger and Teresa Russell, who just give great performances, being directed by Bob Raffleson, a, a wonderful um, a music score. Of course, we know that he has done really wonderful voiceovers. And most recently, of course, he's the daddy in Everything Everywhere All at Once. And I'm not sure how many of the, you were there. It was still kind of a COVID period. But, you know, May 2022 was a wonderful time. And, and he's, like, he's, he's just so busy. It was just, um, I've known him, James and his family for decades. And, and, but I've never seen him so busy. Uh, next year, he's coming out with a new film, which he co-wrote as a story writer and, and was one of the producers, Patsy Lee and The Keepers of the Five Kingdoms. And it's a wonderful role for him. It's not coming out till next year, but I wanted to uh, leave you with this because the future is just so bright for James. It's as though he's you know, starting anew. Here he is, M Mr. James Hong. Mr. James Hong. Here we go. Mr. James Hong. And um, what? Peter. What? Peter. What? 
Okay, uh, well, I, you know, you know. What, uh, well, where's James? Where, yeah. Is he is he going to make it at all? Well, I'm so happy to see you people out here, and uh, did you enjoy the movie, really? <laughs> it, it's really a classic, isn't it, Arthur and Peter? It's a classic, huh? don't you yeah, think? Let's, yeah, let's, yeah, uh, he might have an Dennis answer. Let's discuss. call Dennis out. Ladies and Dennis gentlemen. Dunn, Wang Chi, he's a lead, smart guy. Yeah, he's the a smart movie. guy. The leading man. Ni hao, ni hao. Is this working? Actually, he, Dennis couldn't come. I'm his father. <laughs> <laughs> Why wasn't a big success in the beginning? Do you remember that? It, it well, not being know, a big success? It's interesting. I remember um, when we were shooting the film, uh, John Carpenter said he didn't know if the, if the American public was ready for this film. Because, you know, he's playing John, uh, Kurt Russell's playing John Wayne, a bumbling guy who keeps oh, uh, the, the, the mic. mic. Oh, and, uh, you know, I was. I ended up being the hero in the end. And I, I think, yeah, I think there were people kind of disconcerted with the, they weren't sure what to do with the John Wayne character because he was turning it upside down. Another, <laughs> another factor involved in the, in the situation during that time, <laughs> they did not know how to really push the film. Mm. Uh, they didn't know how to sell it to the public. At that time, uh, I think you people may have remembered, uh, uh, the, the Alien was coming out at approximately the same time with the studio. So they, the, the bosses up in the studio said, let's... Uh, put the advertisement money into the alien and forget about Big Trouble in Little China. So they did, and uh, the alien, of course, is a uh, history how big a bigger draw it was. And so therefore, Big Trouble just fell to the side, and we weren't uh, paying any attention. We became just another Chinaman film, so. Uh. <laughs> but, but thank God for the audience and the, the, the cult following that happened afterward, years and years, and now. People tell me they've seen it a, a hundred times at least, and and it's a, a fan favorite. So yeah, thank well, you. Well, I. I Ask a question. Okay. No, go ahead. I, yeah, I, I get a sense from Dennis, especially that. It was a different time for, and you too, actually, you, you voiced it, that there was a different time in 1984 for the presence of Chinese American or Chinese uh, Asian American actors and stories like this, where Kurt Russell, the white guy, isn't the hero. That it ended up being Wang Chi being the hero. Was it a different time then for you as, as performers? Did you see that happening? I mean, and I think 84, 83, it was a different, there was some politics going on as well for Asian American actors. Do you, do, did any of that affect any of you? Well, I was in Year of the Dragon, and they, um, yeah. that was the first of them. Actually, I was going to say, it was after uh, China started opening up. I think it had something to do with it. The politics of the time had something to do with it. And they, had, they were interested in Chinese stories. Um, yeah. And that's why I think that's why it... It, uh, they started making, because uh, there were a string of three, uh, you have the dragon, Big Trouble in China, and Last Emperor, all within like a few years of each other. So and you I were in all, all of those. Yeah, but yeah. I, I think it was, I was the right place at the right time, but I think it had to do with the politics 
and China opening up and the end of the Cultural Revolution and it was starting to, um, yeah. starting to blossom. So I think that got Hollywood thinking about, well, let's do something related to Chinese. You know, you know, they didn't have the greatest ideas all the time, but I think this was their effort to address stories of Chinese people, Chinese yeah. Americans they didn't quite understand. Nope. Even the Big Trouble in China is probably the, one of the best ones showing Chinese Americans, I think. Well, before I, I see Peter nodding and said, but before I lose that thought, uh, I just wanted to point out that next Saturday, Dennis will be here with Year of the Dragon uh, next Saturday evening. So please uh, join us for that. And the, la the Last Emperor will be the final show uh, of our series, uh, November 27th. And Joan Chen will be joining us for that screening. But Peter, I saw you nodding your head when I asked that question. Another uh, historical perspective that uh, big trouble in Little China happened was what was going on politically in the community. As Dennis mentioned, the Year of the Dragon had just come out, and then right after we had to deal with the community backlash because the uh, Year of the Dragon had to have a disclaimer put on in, in its front, and the community, Asian Pacific community, were all up in arms against the uh, big trouble in Little China. And that's when John Carpenter had a meeting with the cast and crew and asked for many of our inputs. And many of the people in the, uh, um, the, the crew, uh, like Jim Lau and uh, J uh, Danny Kwan and, and uh, James Liu, were elevated in their positions. And as well as the fact that they met with March Fong Yu, the Secretary of State, had her come on the set and did a lot of community relations, ease and calm the nerves, and brought the consciousness of the actors and cast into the film itself. That's where James Car uh, Jan uh, John Carpenter came in and asked us for our opinion and our input. For example, they asked me, oh, what, do you, what do you want? And I said, well, I would love long hair in the film because I've seen all the, I grew up with all those Hong Kong Chinese movies. And they said, the other two actors said, no, we don't want any of that stuff. And I was able to convince John to let me have a $3,000 wig, another hour and a half in makeup and hair, and because they had to anchor those things down. And so a lot of input came from there. And um, so it was a lot of stuff that, a lot of feedback that John Carpenter put in there and helped us along with that. Yeah, John was very open to suggestions. Like, I, yes. I think in the script, I, they had me wearing a ninja costume, and I didn't want to do that, because I wanted to make sure that I was a Chinese American on screen. So I brought this uh, flight jumpsuit, you know, a military, Air Force jumpsuit, and I showed it to John and the costume designers. Yeah, you can wear that. So, you know, they, they're very, yeah, they were very open to, the, to our ideas and our input. Yeah, that was, that was pretty amazing. He was very open. And so another thing with, with uh, Dennis, Dennis' character, you know, it's the first time you see a flip in hero and sidekick, where in John, um, uh, Dennis plays the hero in, in actuality, and it's Kurt Russell that plays the bumbling, clumsy fool, but, you know, that's the... That show business, right? It's a, well, in a it's way, a switching uh, of the times. You know, uh, and and Peter uh, knows a lot because at that time, uh, and maybe afterwards or before, he was on the board of directors, uh, as I was once too, and he was on the board of director of SAG, and so he's very, in yes, yes, one of the first ones. So um, uh, he dealt with those things a lot. Uh, with me, I, I was too much into low pan to concentrate on being that old guy who's uh, circling the universe, uh, just looking for the green eyes. I didn't know exactly what to do with that role, you know. It, it, uh, and, um, and two girls with green eyes, uh, what is this world becoming to, you know? <laughs> so I had to marry the both of them, actually. So maybe on the sequel, I'll come back and still look for the, <laughs> the, the two girls with the green eyes. But I... Uh, advanced to, uh, as you, did you show that poster of Patsy Lee and the, um, um, uh, what is it? I can't remember all the names of the new film coming out so next long. year. Yeah. Keepers of the Five uh, Kingdoms. So I made uh, that movie, and I, I've been trying to do movies of my own, and uh, uh, that's the only way you can express yourself, you know. So please see that movie when it comes out. And if you, any of you have good scripts and uh, whatnot, uh, we're all interested, right? Uh, <laughs> yes. 
Okay, we're gonna, um, you know, this could go on all night, I'm sure, but- uh, Oh, aren't I, we? <laughs> yeah, but before we go on all night, I, I do, because we have another sh film coming up, which is Black Widow, yeah. and I, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that, because yeah. uh, uh, we talked a few years ago, and I remember uh, I asked you, you know, out of your 500 film credits plus, what are some of your favorite roles? And you mentioned Black Widow. Mm -hmm. And uh, and because of that, I went, I sought it out and watched okay. it. I understood it. And, and we're programming that after the intermission. I think we're having intermission. Is that where Ashley May? Are we? Yeah. So can just to prepare the audience uh, who are staying for that, what is it about the Black Widow film that you 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 look at as one of your favorite parts? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a long story in a way. I, I did the, uh, as, as you will see, I did the, uh, um, the, the detective who, who was into drugs, you know. So that was a, a very, um, in other words, there was a lot of meat to chew into that role, as you, you will see. Um, and I, 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 I was uh, and, uh, just taking from the Stanislavski and, and my all my lessons in, in, uh, um, in the early, early year when I first came to Hollywood in 1954, approximately in 55, I formulated a, uh, the first Chinese-American um, acting class because before that, they, they weren't really serious about acting. They just wanted to get the money and go home. But I, I was not that type of actor. I wanted to be more than that. So I put my best into this um, film you're about to see, Black Widow. And uh, Bob Rafelson was the director, I believe. And he stopped me, I think it was in Thailand. Uh, uh, Bob, Bob said, every country I tour with Black Widow, they always ask, who is that guy that's playing the, uh, the detective? And, uh, uh, and he said he was going to go to Fox and, and tell them the, to nominate me for the Academy Awards for that role, you know. But he told me that Fox said, it's not popular, not pop, in other words, n n was not a big box office success and, and therefore uh, he, they will not nominate me for the Academy Award. So, but that just goes to show you, you know, you try your best and do, do your best and uh, give it all you got and you gave a good performance, but it just depends on what the studio head, head says. If they said, we're not gonna try to nominate him, so, you know. So that's been sort of the, the story of my life in a way. I, I try my best in every role I've done. Uh, and, and, you know, somehow it doesn't seem to get the recognition. Uh, like the Earth Stood Still, that one scene I did with uh, Keanu Reeves, you know, my agent likes that scene the best. And it was very touching. There's just another story about that film too. With every film I've done, there seems to uh, uh, be another story. But it's all, all uh, in a sense, hint with that background of the Asian Americans not being recognized as a top uh, performers. You know, that was my early career. So, but I, I'm glad I, I kept going. Now I've got uh, 500 credits, and uh, the Daniel Day Kim said 700, counting all the voiceovers and everything. Can I have some applause for that? Please? <laughs> And if I, uh, you know, maybe I can meet you people back here when I'm 95 or 96, I'll have another 100 movies maybe, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it, I, I've enjoyed making movies for people like you who really appreciate the fine arts of movie and you can see what the actors are trying to do, you know. I can tell by just looking at you people, you appreciate what we actors put into our roles and into the film. So I want to thank them. And thank you for inviting me. I know we got to move into the other uh, movie. Uh, is that right? No, no. Th yeah, in fact, we, uh, we are at a perfect timing. Uh, you have a perfect sense of time. And I want to thank Peter, Dennis, especially you, and your family for <laughs> making it possible for you to be here. So <laughs> thank you, James. And thank all of you for coming.
everyone for joining me for this edition of Backstage Pass with Leah Chang. Until next time. Backstage Pass with Leah Chang airs on Sunday at 6.30 on Fios 34, RCN 83, and Spectrum 56 slash 1996. If you missed the show, you can watch it on my YouTube channel.